Well, for more insights on this, we're joined from New York by Anthony Chan, Managing Director of J.P. Morgan Chase Private Client, and also by Max Wolf, Chief Economist at Manhattan Venture Partners. Welcome to you both. So Anthony, I'm going to start with you. The recent yuan devaluation came as a surprise, sent jitters across the markets. Now, the PBOC says the exchange rate fluctuations were within their expectations, but they still stepped in to stabilize the markets. How worried should investors be? Well, I think that right now, one of the things that you've got to keep in mind is in the last 12 months, because China continues to peg to the U.S. dollar, the Chinese currency actually appreciated, especially relative to many of its trading partners. So we are seeing a small uh, depreciation of the Chinese uh, currency, but that comes on the back of a, of a strength in the, in the overall currency. So I would say this is still not a major problem. And Max, would you agree? Yeah, so I would take a slightly different tack. I think there's sort of two issues here. One is the economic policy, where you've had a lot of reticence to allow a free-floating currency, and you have a timing issue on selecting to be a little <clears throat> bit more market-driven now when the disposition of that is almost certainly to go down or devalue the currency a bit, which we saw. But that's the economic and maybe the lesser in terms of the risk factors. The greater is this looks a little bit like a beggar thy neighbor policy in a tough period for the world where exports don't look great across the board and many countries are worried about growth going forward in part because China is slowing and they won't particularly like a small competitive disadvantage that they're getting from China even if it does make sense and those comments are correct about being dragged or pulled up because you're pegged to the dollar and the dollar's had quite a run as money rotates back to the U.S. from a weakening emerging market space over the last 12 months. Now, Anthony, I'm going to bring you in here. Uh, how would you say, in, to give it some context, how would you say the yuan's performance stacks up against perhaps other Asian currencies over the last year? Well, certainly compared to other Asian currencies, the uh, Chinese renminbi has been very strong. In fact, right before uh, the Chinese uh, actually went into value, when you compare it to, say, the Malaysian ringgit, uh, the Chinese currency was uh, uh, much stronger vis-a-vis -vis that currency by almost a little over 9% the Thai bat, uh, the Korean won, all these currencies were in fact weakening against uh, the Chinese uh, currency. So I would say that this is more a defensive posture. With regard to the economics, I've looked at the export elasticity uh, of change. In the was uh, now and what that means is that now for every 1% devaluation, uh, you essentially see export growth uh, picking up by about 1.2 percent. So to the extent that you see a 4 percent, say, de depreciation uh, in the value of the Chinese currency, that's likely to boost overall exports by close to 5 percent. But don't forget that that also reduces imports. So in terms of real GDP economic impact, uh, a 4 percent uh, reduction in the currency is probably going to lead to something like in uh, when you consider these real effective exchange rates, so about just four tenths of one percent. And China is uh, trying to stabilize their economy and trying to get you seven percent growth. So I would say every little helps, even though we're still talking about small small numbers here. Now, Anthony, I want to bring uh, bring in Max here. When we look at the short term effect of the devaluation, what do you think is going to be the likely impact on China's economy? Yeah, so I think it'll be positive. The, the question here is just whether it occasions retaliatory or more protectionist measures from other camps and other parties who have their own vulnerabilities and watch China possibly make a major international decision here, which suggests they're very interested just looking at what's good for their economy and for their social stability in the next few years, which is wise and makes sense. There's always a risk, even if it's not completely fair or reasonable, that other folks take that ball and run with it in directions that are not particularly good for global coordination or cooperation or ultimately for China, which is, after all, the fast-growing second-largest economy in the world and therefore vulnerable to global economic developments of many types and kinds. And Anthony, do you see that perhaps shifting in the next five, ten years? Well, I think over the next five, ten years, I think the Chinese economy will continue to grow much faster. But I still find it fascinating that we're so fixated about a currency devaluation of close to 4 percent when you consider that over the last year or so, uh, the dollar has strengthened against the euro 
by close to 21%. In other words, that euro has depreciated by almost 21%, and no one is making any noise about it. And all of a sudden, the Chinese currency is down close to 4%, and everybody thinks it's a trade war. What happens when the uh, Japanese yen depreciates against the U.S. dollar, which it has, and that's been one of the things that has strengthened economic growth in Japan? And what happens when the Korean won has actually depreciated against uh, the U.S. dollar? Uh, or the Malaysian ringgit. Nobody talks about those things. Now, I realize that it's because China is a big overall economy, but guess what? Europe is not so small either. So you're thinking perhaps they're, they're overreacting or to perhaps making more out of it that they're a bigger fish to fry perhaps than, than the valuation in the UN. Um, I'm, we're going to look at commodity prices, which have slumped in some of the world's biggest manufacturing countries. Um, what sort of impact do you expect to see for them, uh, Max? Yeah, well, so part of the reason I think the Chinese authorities are more comfortable with the depreciating yuan is that currency prices have fallen. So part of what might historically be a problem for a major export economy that's dependent for natural resources on imports is a depreciation of the currency would be painful there. That's more than completely offset, A, by the strengthening dollar, B, by the fact that currency, the currencies are nowhere near as big in their price movement as the weakness in commodities, and C, by the fact that whatever works to reduce imports and increase exports is also extremely important in the context of the Chinese struggle to meet or beat 7-plus percent GDP targets, which are a big deal. But again, all things have to do with how much is policy versus market-driven and how fast changes happen. I agree the size of change is probably less big and less likely to catch the global eye than changes in policy and or rapid movements of anything, whether that's commodities or currencies. And we're going to take a look at the China-U.S. relationship. As China takes these steps to, towards a more market-oriented exchange rate, you know, there are also those who are worried about imports to the U.S. becoming cheaper and exports to China becoming more expensive. What sort of impact do you think that's going to have on the China-U.S. relationship? Anthony. Well, I think there's going to be a little bit of friction. There's no doubt. Already you are hearing uh, some people in Washington uh, complaining about the fact that the uh, depreciation of the Chinese currency is going to hurt the U.S. But as I said, I find it fascinating that when you hear other currencies like the the euro depreciating dramatically, or by the fa by the by the way, when we had quantitative easing and our U.S. dollar actually depreciated, which ended up helping the U.S. economy, we didn't hear a lot of noise from other countries complaining when our dollar uh, went down when we had quantitative easing. And then the final point I will make about commodities is that the initial impact may be to make these commodities a little bit cheaper. But if this is somewhat successful and it increases growth in China, and they have been the swing consumer for many of these commodities, guess what? It's going to increase the demand eventually for these commodities, and that should push the price higher. Now, and Anthony, I, I do want to give Max also uh, a chance to, to respond. Um, Max, your final thoughts? Yeah, so I do think that these type of moves don't really create incremental global growth. And the reason that there's some possibility for friction, although not huge, nothing to panic about, is because you're really moving around various imports and exports. You're moving a little growth from one country to another or from out or into your country. And that's why there's a little bit of an irritation that can create some difficulty. And that's why I don't think it's a major contribution, plus or minus, to global growth, total jobs, or total consumption of commodities. That's usually not how it works. It's more redistributive than it is growth generating as a general rule. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. Anthony Chan, Max Wolf, thank you so much.